Hello and welcome to, well, a history of naval aviation, but it's not a history history. Please note, I'm not going to be spending my time having a long discussion about dates and times and when different aircraft came into service. This is a historical overview. This is going to be looking at what naval aviation does as time goes on and how it evolves, and how it changes. And also how our perception of the past is in many ways shaped as much by the propaganda which was convenient at certain points in history, as it is by the reality and by the popular narrative which can skip whole events. What do I mean by skipping whole events? I mean that history doesn't always, in terms of the popular framework, record itself accurately. In fact, there are fairly large swathes of historical terminology and periods which are completely misunderstood by the general thrust of history. And you will see, you will, can usually tell this because ask any history, historical specialist or any historian or some person who's passionate about any area of history Ask them to sit down and say, if you were reading a general history book, what are you going to pick apart? What points are you going to pick apart? And they will have points that come up in almost every history book when they're talking about general background of an era or a period. They'll go, oh, that's wrong. Or that's not the correct thing of what actually happened. That's an interpretation of it. That's not the case. And it's fun, because almost every historian ends up falling back to some extent on the clichés to fill in the gaps of their own lack of specialist knowledge when they are writing a book. I, you know, I was lucky. My first book, Travel Files and Daring's, this is it. It's a shameless book plug. But I'm lucky because it focuses on an area which I know quite a lot about, including in general wider knowledge. And because of its subject matter, because of its subject focus, it keeps quite tightly focused. So I don't have to go and make wild generalizations to fill in gaps while I'm talking about things outside of it. I don't have to. And not even wild generalizations. Most historians aren't. They are just going with what the historical consensus is. And the thing is about a historical consensus is it can be wrong. I've had this discussion at a lot of conferences, and I go, the perception is X. We all agree, that's what's commonly held, but we all know X isn't the quite, isn't the true case. And one of those areas is naval aviation, one of those areas where a lot of the perception going back is wrong. It's one of two things. And... The scenario is either that naval aviation doesn't exist before World War II, or that it does exist and everyone should have known it was coming and should have concentrated on it. And I'm going to apologise now. Steve Clark, not a relative, but a very good commentator on this channel, and someone who is very informed on many things falls into the latter trap. And I wasn't looking for this. But, and please note, Steve, this is no denigration of you, because this is, this would happen to a lot of people. But one of the troubles is you are commentating on a channel which is run by someone who's done his PhD thesis on naval aviation, development naval aviation in the 1920s and 1930s on how the aircraft carriers and the aircraft developed together. And you write this beautiful point 
and all of it is basically, well, aircraft were going to be amazing, you know, it seems to me like a slow dead-end solution, by the Sunday 30s, the solution is the carrier, as it was World War II, big guns are great at 20 miles, but a carrier can hit you 150 miles with dive bombing rockets and torpedoes, no matter how good the torpedo defense armor, just like Bismarck Turfits, you can't protect your rudder and one, uh, one kilo, uh, one, uh, I don't know, one kilo, uh, uh, one kilogram, one thousand, pa uh, thousand pound bombs, I'm not sure, can end up in a boiler room down the uh, smokestacks. You are perfectly right by 1945. And that's fine. But I'm talking in that video, and that's on the G3, N3 classes video, about 1920. 1921. And there is no chance. There are no aircraft which are doing that. The Sop with Cuckoo is certainly not managing to hit you for torpedo 150 nautical miles away. And no one is carrying bombs that heavy. Not at that point. And the torpedoes, the aerial torpedoes you're dropping, if we consider some of the technology that goes into developing those systems and make those aerial torpedoes work, that's not being developed yet. They're still just dropping a torpedo from an aircraft and it basically hits the water and goes, whoa! -y. There's a reason I say in nicest way when I did a, 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 a alternate history examination or something. And I started off with a torpedo strike on Wilhelmshaven. And yeah, I said one ship hit. I think I was talking about launching roughly 60 torpedo bombers at them. And I'm thinking one gets hit with a torpedo. And the point is, you can say that technology is coming. You can say we should all see that technology coming. But if we go back 10 years previously, everyone was talking about, I don't know, <sighs> rail guns. Everyone was talking about the coming of all lasers, etc. Lasers aren't mass deployed yet. There's lots of problems with getting them mass deployed, mainly dealing with their energy consumption, but also dealing with the effect of salt water on their lenses. They're working on it. I think they will be for it, but when it, whether it'll be 10 years or 15 years, I don't know. Could be 20 years. It's the same with rail guns. And it's the same with Gauss guns. And it's the same with all sorts of weapon systems which have been coming for years. People talk about drones as new things. There was the... There were all sorts of uncrewed aircraft flying around in the 1930s. Including the Queen Bee system. Which was used for testing anti-aircraft gunnery. So, the point is... You can tell me a technology is coming, but I don't know when it's going to come to fruition. So, you're therefore put in a scenario. That technology is coming, and it might achieve a percolation. It might actually come into utility. It might not. But this is technology I know works. And I can build a better, a bigger and better version of that, which I know will work. And I can prove it will work. That's the situation in the 1920s. That's the situation in the 1930s. So even to an extent the situation is still in the 1940s. Remember, one of the reasons why there are no more capital ships built after Vanguard and Iowa's and the French ships are completed is because the Soviet Union doesn't have battleships or battle cruisers for them to deal with. If the Soviet Union did... Well, the situation might have changed a bit. Because pound for pound, the battleship was still one of the best ship-killing systems ever built.
yes, you've got the range, and yes, you can bring that in, but it's not that easy. Nothing in naval warfare is a zero-sum A trumps B game. It just never is. And this is the point when we get into naval aviation. It starts off, and I usually started off with the Mayfly. Which wasn't even called the Mayfly by the Royal, or the Royal Navy or the Admiralty. It was called the Mayfly by its crew. And it's procured because the Germans are looking into them. And the Royal Navy is thinking, what is it for? It's for reconnaissance. It's for information. It's for doing the thing you need to do, most of all in naval warfare. Finding your enemy and, work, and making it, counting their strength so you can deploy yourself appropriately. Information has always been the most valuable thing in naval warfare because whilst there are certain choke points and positions around the world where fleets tend to end up passing, even in the age of sail, and even today, the ocean is a massive expanse of water. And as many German U-boat commanders in World War II would testify to, there can be a lot of ocean and even a massive amount of ships can be impossible to find in it. Because again, we, like, we talk about World War II and the convoy war... We talk a lot about the convoys which were attacked, the convoys which were damaged, but there were a lot of convoys which made it across, which had several days of storms and never saw an enemy ship. Didn't see anything into any enemy aircraft or activity until they got close to the coast of Britain, when, with the approaching to ports, etc., their sort of vectors and positions start to narrow down greatly. Because it's a huge expanse. And we're talking about a world without satellites. So, the themes of naval aviation. Information warfare. I've broadly put that into. Reconnaissance, counter-reconnaissance, spotting, shadowing. I know most information warfare, when we talk about it these days, people tend to focus on stuff that you associate with the internet and those scenarios and that sort of battle, but information warfare is older and in naval terms, reconnaissance, counter-reconnaissance, spotting, shadowing, all these things are factors. And knowing where your enemy is. Stopping your enemy knowing where you, where you are. Spotting. Well, spotting is an important thing because that's providing direction for your ships. Spotting is probably the first lethal part of naval warfare which was aviation based. And it's very simple. You stick an aircraft up, your gun can fire X miles. You can see Y miles. However, you put an aircraft up higher, it can not only see X plus miles, it can also accurately chart the fall of your shot and therefore refine your targeting so you're more likely to hit your opponent more accurately and most importantly more quickly, which means they get knocked out more quickly, which means you win easier. Shadowing. Tracking the enemy fleet, the enemy formation, flying around it, identifying all the targets, noting their positions, but all the time sending out regular beeps, messages, to guide in the, your own fleet. That's what the Germans wanted to do with their airships. That's what the British wanted to do with theirs. The thing is, 
we talk about naval warfare as, especially after World War II, you know, you, you talk about the development of aircraft. And in many ways, you get a wrong picture. Because there are multiple generations of aircraft between 1920 and 1940. There are even multiple generations between World War II. I would argue there's roughly about three generations of aircraft in World War II's time frame alone. Whereas there's been about mm, four in the previous preceding 20 years. There haven't been that many generations of battleships. There haven't been that many generations of even cruisers in that time period. Destroyers have to an extent, but even they have been rather stunted generation-wise because of the treaty system, because of the limitations built on their construction. It's forced navies to be very conservative or, and also to not build ships entirely. I did a video which will now come out on the 2nd of May, by the, point I, by the time I'm recording this, about the lost generation of dreadnoughts. The G freeze and the N freeze. If you consider that the Royal Navy between 1905 and roughly 1913 had gone through three generations of dreadnoughts, dreadnought types, the Orion types, which were the first super dreadnoughts, and the Queen Elizabeth types, 15 inch guns. Imagine how many generations could have existed in the 1920s and 30s. If there had been no treaties and governments, when the seeking to deal with economic collapse had done what British governments often do, start constructing warships because they can provide a lot of employment in a lot of places. Strike, land and sea targets. For security. Counter reconnaissance. Now, why does that come under both information warfare and um, and for security? Well, information warfare in counter reconnaissance, you can allow the enemy to see a portion of your fleet, but not see another. So you can give them one image of your fleet while denying them the other. Theoretically, in force security, you could stop them seeing any part of your fleet at all by taking out all their reconnaissance assets. It's an adaptable scenario. Anti-submarine warfare and, of course, air defense, in case the enemy does strike at you. And again, that's a thing to think about when we're ta talking about battleships versus carriers. Well, in a task force, like the British were planning on building and in sort of the interwar years for hunting, especially surface raiders, and for enemy carrier groups if they came out. If you look at it from the British perspective, they were often expecting one to two carriers, hoping for two, and two fast capital ships, plus some cruisers and some destroyers into a fast task force. Force H is the bare bones minimum one when it's one carrier, one fast battle, a capital ship, usually Renown or Hood but usually renown, and destroyers and a town-class cruiser as a rule, usually, Shef uh, usually Sheffield. You know, that is the minimum of the force which the British were hoping to organise. But if you think about that from the point of view of, right, and so where's your air defence start? Well, your air defence starts off with your reconnaissance battle, your information warfare battle. You stop the enemy finding you and stop the enemy managing your reporting position, then you're fine. If you then your next level of air defense is maneuvering and not being where you're where they think you might be. Third level is then your air defense, as in your fighters breaking up enemy aircraft air attacks to into smaller manageable groups, then your heavy artillery, break, uh, heavy AA breaking them into smaller groups, so you have an aircraft attacking ships in ones or twos, and then you have your medium artillery, uh, medium AA artillery break, uh, trying to shoot them down, whilst your ship dodges. 
That is the plan. And it works very well when it works and everything is there to make it work. Yes, it does get very much refined by radar. Yes, there are problems with getting it all together to work. But if you consider what happens in the Mediterranean, and you consider the convoy battles which are fought, not just the ones which are won, but the ones which are lost as well, there is reasoning there. There is viability there. And capital ships are part of that. Why? Because here is the other scary thing. We know what happens when a carrier gets caught unawares. Now, let's be honest, Glorious should not have happened. It shouldn't have happened. It's completely against British doctrine, it's completely against everything. It's a the Admiral had to defend himself by going, well, I presumed he'd have aircraft in the air as his doctrine. The Admiral, in ch Admiral above, the Captain who let them go, but even he got censured. And if it hadn't been for the fact they really needed as many admirals as they could at the time, probably would not have found himself re-employed. It was that serious. But the fact is, you are talking about an integrated battle force from almost the get-go in terms of naval aviation. What does this mean for historical narrative? Well, there's these group of people you hear about in history called Battleship Admirals. Yes. They're amazing. They're admirals who clung to the battleship as the ultimate arbiter of everything, even when carriers were available. Even when in naval aviation, they are these ultimate sucking months. They don't exist. Not like the perception exists of them. I will use sometimes the term to describe them, but what I mean is usually admirals who are trying to stick, who are sticking closer to the more conservative side of naval aviation than other admirals who are pushing more on naval aviation's boundaries. And what do I mean about that? Well, the last battleship admiral to put out is probably the scrapping of HMS Howe, because she's the last admiral class battleship to go. The constant naval warfare, from a battle perspective, are whoever finds their enemy first and engages them first tends to win. Because you decide the, where the battle takes place, you decide the pace of the battle, you decide pretty much everything to do with the battle that matters, and so you can shape it to your advantage. Aircraft allow you to find the enemy first. Aircraft allow you to shadow your so uh, shadow in first. Aircraft allow you to engage with your battleship guns at longer range. This is the point. We think of naval aviation purely as the strike weapon. That is what tends to come through. And we'll talk about it and Again, please, Steve, don't read anything into this other than you are a very nice, very kind, very passionate historian. Well, history. Yeah, historian, I'm going to say. And um, history enthusiast. And you provided, unbeknowingly, provided the comment at exactly the right time which demonstrates where this slip-up can happen. Because here you are, and you are focusing in immediately on the killing capability of the aircraft as the firepower they carry. And the reality is, that doesn't exist until you're talking in the late, in the mid, well, probably 1944-45 as a strong tempo. In Bismarck, Bismarck gets killed by a torpedo bomber. No. She gets damaged by a torpedo bomber. And they launch a lot of torpedoes to do that. And almost hit Sheffield. Or is it Southampton? Eh, I've... Brain. Brain is um, not remembering that one this evening. I apologise. 
I'm sure someone will put the right one in the comments and I'll thank them for it in advance. The point is, that is one part of what naval aviation offers. If you are thinking purely of going and attacking with your aircraft, great. But for most of the period we're talking about in the interwar period, that's not going to kill your enemy. It's going to damage them but it's not going to kill them. The British spend a lot of money developing the systems to try and make them and be able to kill them in that period with aircraft. They get to it by about, well, luckily 1940-ish. But even then, if you consider the success rate versus the Italians in Taranto, yeah, they knock out three battleships for a few months and then it goes down and some of those are never fixed and some of those are fixed it takes time but you needed more aircraft there to take them all out and that was with those ships not maneuvering in harbor and with possibly the pinnacle of anti of torpedo dropping aircraft available in the world at that time which sounds funny to say about the Sawfish, but I'll get to that in a bit. But here is the other option you could have used. You could have said, right then, what's our most powerful weapon we have? It's the battleship guns. So, put the aircraft in range to spot, that is to fly in a position where, even at night, they can see their target. Get the capital ship within range. And only hmm. Armageddon with all the 15 inch shells, 16 inch shells you can get. Probably don't want to do it with Nelson and Romney, actually. Probably would want to be, uh, want to ma make it as, you know, Queen of uh, upgraded Queen Elizabeth classes, uh, class vessels, renown. Maybe Hood and Repulse if you were trying to do a dash in, dash out, and as many 15 inch guns as possible and have them rain down on the harbour. Directed fire, maximum range. Let's be honest, if you'd done that, if you'd been prepared to risk that and the air attack, which would no doubt come the next day on the groups withdrawing you could have done a lot more damage than those torpedo bombers achieved because the amount of shells you could have got down on ships which couldn't have maneuvered couldn't have fired back because they probably wouldn't be able to see where you are because you'd just be flashes on the horizon whilst moving and gauging range and everything at night with visual equipment very very difficult Whereas the right, you know, as the flare-dropping aircraft of the actual attack on Toronto showed, an aircraft could pop around dropping flares, keeping itself at high altitude and seeing, spotting what was going on in terms of the ships down below quite well. Now, yes, there are problems with that force getting out, and yes, the whole scenario is, becomes very, very mathematical. But you turn up with six capital ships, with between them 44 15-inch guns. Firing on targets they can spot and see. That's okay, Belty. So, what do I really mean when I talk about as battleship animals versus naval animals, carrier animals? Well, 
the debate was over what aircraft could do, could potentially do, and could probably do. This is a very substantive debate. And there are, as I put there, no straightforward answers. There are no simple answers. Torpedo spotter reconnaissance. The designation for the fairy swordfish. Torpedo spotter reconnaissance. Torpedo strike. But spotter and reconnaissance are both information warfare. And that was where aircraft were really important in the 1920s and 30s. Not in providing the killing system, because they didn't. They w had the potential to get there. But they weren't there then. And 150 nautical miles of a torpedo is not what a Sopwith cooker was designed for. Not there and getting back. The trouble was, in this period, in this early period, you're looking at if X worked out as it should be, then aircraft will be able to carry perform Y, which means they'll be able to do Z roll. Z roll. But that's a lot of if, should, potential. That's not a lot of certainty. And you have a further complication going on in the development of naval aviation. You have the fact that you have two debates going on. And sometimes people misconstrue the two. And they misconstrue statements in one debate for a statement in the other debate. You have people going on, Oh, we should not have any battleships at all. We should replace the entire fleet with aircraft. Well, justify that in the 1920s and 30s. You can believe that aircraft are going to ultimately be amazing, but... In 1920s, there's not a single aircraft out there which is going to sink a crude maneuvering battleship at sea. I know there are tests where battleships are sunk by aircraft in that period, but those battleships are sitting, moored, with quite a lot of their holes internally open up, uh, opened, and... Um, they're not maneuvering, they're not crude, they're not doing damage control or anything. And yes, you can say, we sunk it. We sunk the battleship. But what you really did was annoy the Navy who wanted to inspect that ship for damage so they could see what the damage was done by aircraft and bombs operating as they likely would do with, at the time, with the idea of an air defense going up from the, uh, from the ship and with it maneuvering. But no, you decided to change the rules so it could be a more accurate simulation. You got your kill, but you stopped anyone getting information from it. And that's the real problem. Once you have those two debates going on. Because often the nuanced and contextual debate doesn't get any of the historical coverage. And so the debate we hear about in the 1920s and 30s is the lower debate. It's the loud debate between those who are the air power eulogists. Not just enthusiastic, but eulogists who sing the praises, Air power can do all this. Gilio Duhay with his bombers carrying a hundred tons of bombs and flattening cities in a single run with chemical and biological warfare. Yeah. But don't worry. Such a plan would stop the senseless slaughter of, uh, you know, World War I styles trench warfare. So it was a good, considered a good thing. Yeah. And I do know I do for almost the second time this year I have the Blackburn Blackburn up on the screen. And I should have had a warning about how ugly you know, your eyes were going to get hurt. But I thought I'd leave it there and not say anything. Because what's its role? Well, it's information warfare. 
its reconnaissance, its spotting, its strike direction, which it does do at certain points. And it's airborne early warning again, because people looking out from it with binoculars, looking around going, ah, we see enemy aircraft. Send a message to the carrier, launch fighters. And that's all information and warfare. This thing carries machine guns. It doesn't even carry bombs for anti-submarine warfare. It's literally an information warfare asset. So literally the size and shape it is because of the necessity of putting the maps out for reconnaissance and spotting. And for being able to draw on those charts and sort of work it out. That's what defines and shapes it. That's what naval warfare and naval aviation is in the 1920s. It's not about strike. It's not about hitting the enemy with anything. If you, can, if you have some torpedo bombers, great. What can those torpedoes do? Who knows? Something, perhaps. We'll see. They're better than nothing, and they provide an extra bonus into operations, but... They're more for dealing damage than destruction. And damage is important. Damage is useful. It slows your enemy down. Makes them weak. And if you're the Royal Navy and you're thinking about using those things at night, and trust me, in the 1920s they're already thinking about using those things at night and starting to work and developing the capabilities which are going to allow their aircraft to do night flying and their carriers to operate at night, then that's even more of a likelihood because at night the enemy might be stupid. They might sail in straight lines. They might not think about enemy aircraft coming into attack. So you could do some damage in the night, which will stop them being able to do anything in the day other than sit like plump turkeys waiting for you to take out in the day uh, at your t leisure. And that's it. Because you wound one ship, two ships. You take damage their rudders like happened with Bismarck. They have to decide, are they going to sink them themselves? Are they going to leave them there? Or are they going to try and protect them as they withdraw? Either way, you've just shaped the battle and now your battleships can engage when you like. And, hell, and yet, later on you have this, the fairy swordfish. The wonderful vessel, which is probably the finest torpedo launching asset of its era. Why? Because I've been over many, many times and I'm going to keep putting out there until people finally believe me. Because of its technology for launching its torpedoes. When I say believe me, because they look at it and go, it's a biplane, it can't be that advanced. Well, guess what? It's easy to repair, easy to maintain, it can be flown at night with... Very, uh, with great simplicity, it can take a lot of damage and keep on going. And most importantly, it can fly in such a way that it can drop a torpedo with a spool coming down from the front so to provide tension wire on a torpedo that along with its fins mean that it will belly flop into the water, landing flat and going along shallow enough to actually hit the targets on the surface. Rather than torpedoes without fins, or anything, which do that virtually by the time they reach the water, and then go, uh, then eventually maybe bob up if they don't hit the bottom. Ones with fins, which do sort of that, and again go deep before hitting uh, coming up, which is why you find so many torpedoes at the bottom of Pearl Harbor. The tension wire is what makes the difference. And that takes time to develop. That comes into service 
with not the first generation of swordfish, although it's designed for them. It comes into gener service with the swordfish about 1937, 38. So before that some point, the torpedoes went down. I would have got all gone lot down. Now, yes, you can go tracing and people will tell me, oh, well, Alex, there was an example fitted to an aircraft in 1933. Yes, there was. I started testing in 1933. Gets deployed with everything by 1937. So that's about four years. And before it was even fitted to an aircraft, they'd been working on it for about eight years. And when I say working on it, they've been working on trying to work out a system to make the torpedoes not dive deep when they hit the water. So you're talking about something which it starts to work on in 1925. Do you know that that's going to give you any useful results before the next war? Do you know when the next war is going to be? In 1932, they predicted they had 10 years till the next war. That's when they get rid of the 10-year rule. War breaks out in 1939. 1930, uh, earlier than 1939, if you include China in World War II. There's your problem. And there's the reason why saying, oh, they should have known that aircraft were going to be the future and we should develop our own aircraft and we don't need to do the stuff we do with the capital ships and develop them falls down. Because, yeah, they might be the future, but when is that future going to be? Is that future going to be before the next war or after the, ne after the war after that? You don't know. So yes, you keep developing the stuff, you keep developing the systems, and you hope they're going to produce something, but you also have to develop other systems which will work today, and will work tomorrow, because you don't know if this one is going to work till next week. If you look at the swordfish again, look at its roles. It does information warfare, it's reconnaissance, spotting, strike direction, airborne early warning, it does them all. And people go, well, it's not doing airborne early warning. It doesn't have air search radar. No, it doesn't use radar for airborne early warning. But they get do get lofted up and used at various points to spot enemy strikes coming in. Why? Because if you broadcast on your radar at certain points, the enemy can see you and detect you using your radar. So you want to have a passive system of air, aerial spotting. For the air, air, air search. Put a swordfish up there. Put an albacore up there. Put another multi-seed aircraft. with Where you can have one person flying. Scanning the sky while they're flying. And two more sitting there with binoculars. Looking around everywhere. Scanning each section of the sky to see if they see something. It's not perfect. But it's a lot better than just sitting in a ship looking out and scanning the, air, uh, scanning the world with your eyes. Strike, targets, land and sea, and thanks to being able to carry bombs, torpedoes and rockets, and anti-submarine. It can carry anti-submarine bombs from the beginning, depth charges very soon after. It's a pretty darn useful aircraft. Hawker Sea Fury. It's a fighter. But is it just a fighter? Information warfare, reconnaissance, spotting, and shadowing. I forgot to put shadowing in there for that one. Yeah, shadowing is also in the very swordfish role. It will wander along near a fleet, keeping its spot, uh, keeping a watch on them. The Royal Navy actually did a look at points of developing a specialist shadowing aircraft for night operations. That was going to be especially quiet and especially, you know, deadly to draw it. Uh, so difficult for the enemy to detect and attack. Well, 
In the end, they didn't. And then they decided the, frankly, using up precious hangar space for four or five of those aircraft, which then couldn't do anything else, was not really worthwhile. Because they were too slow uh, for daytime operations. That's from a Navy which has the swordfish in service. Shows you how slow they were. For security, counter reconnaissance and air defense. And these are flying for the Royal Canadian Navy. Some of the most beautiful aircraft ever built. By this point, you've got developed electronic aids to the point at which that a single seater can be used for all those roles. You've developed the aids and systems whereby a pilot who's in a single seat can do it. You have Supermarine Spitfires being used for spotting for battleship guns in D-Day and other operations afterwards. Because it extends their range. Because it's useful. Because those guns are useful. And believe it or not, the same is going on with the Sea Fury. As powerful an aircraft as it is. You hook up that with Va one of those with Vanguard, and you'll see what devastation they can bring about. And here is the real point. Those systems don't go away. That standard of operating doesn't change. We talk about Lockheed Martin. People talk today about its revolutionary integrated systems approach and how... It's the sensors are all linked, so everything can, you know, you can fire from one system while getting information from another system. It's not new as a concept. It's new in terms of the capabilities, the amount of data being transferred and systems being used to move the data. It's not new. It's the reconnaissance, spotting, and shadowing. And in fact, if you consider it, these are stealth aircraft. These are, to an extent, their stealthness. Stealthiness is a development of that shadower which the Royal Navy was considering in the 1930s. It's just that, well, now their stealth helps them, yes, but, you know, they also have the ability to attack and do other things, so they're useful. They can strike land and sea targets. And they do, can do counter reconnaissance and air defense. It hasn't changed. The missions haven't changed. The aircraft capabilities have changed, and yes, their weapon systems have greatly improved. But the thing is, there have been some core things from naval aviation from the beginning. And these were core things which everyone agreed on when they started out. I am sure someone will come back to me with a quote of, Yes, but this person favoured building a battleship over a carrier. Yes. They probably did. But read through the subtext. You very quickly find out the reason they consider building they're building a battleship over a carrier is because they think the air the, the view is the aircraft at that point cannot uh, cannot kill as well as a battleship. So it's better to have more battleships to link up with those aircraft carried by carriers to so that those aircraft have more battleships to spot for, and therefore the real killing can be done. The debate is not between battleship admirals and carrier admirals. The debate is between spotting admirals and strike admirals. And even the strike admirals have to admit regularly their aircraft are not there yet. Henderson spends years, the Admiralty spends years campaigning for a dive bombing site because they believe it will be useful in the face of all sorts of intransigence from the Air Ministry. But not to replace battleships, not to replace them, but because, to make their aircraft better. But still, things like the skewer were expected to do 
spotting, a spotting, shadowing, and reconnaissance. This is another reason why the British aircraft tend to be two-seater by the time you get to World War II. Because pretty much all aircraft are required to be able to do these missions. Because the information warfare battle is the most critical phase of the battle. And because British carriers do tend to carry... Well, how do I put this? <sighs> Not as small as some stats like to make out, because some people like to include every aircraft loaded on a carrier, including the ones in boxes, let alone the ones with their wings off, stuck up in the hangar roof, etc. But they do tend to carry less aircraft, because they're also armoured, in terms of the illustrious class, etc. And because of the treaty limitations. But pretty much every aircraft they're carrying can be used for spotting, reconnaissance, and shadowing. Because the British want them to be able to operate long range. Because again, if you have a shadowing aircraft, that makes calling in a night strike much easier. And that's the one point where Operation C in the Battle of the Indian Ocean breaks down. Because... The reports are from reconnaissance aircraft. They don't successfully manage to get an aircraft into a shadowing position on the Japanese fleet. This is despite the Japanese not having night aviation capability at all. If they manage to get a shadower in, pl in place, well, there would no, the strike would never have missed. The strike would have been sent. It would have hit. And who knows how the world would have turned out. The Augusta Westland EH-101 Merlin. I knew someone would probably bring this up and go, well, helicopters, they're single-use assets. They're not. Information warfare, reconnaissance, stress spotting, shadowing, some variants do airborne early warning. Strike, well, sea targets mainly. But some variants can do commando transport, although all can do something in a pinch in terms of getting personnel on board, for land attack. And for security, anti-submarine warfare. People, when they look at this vessel, this is the modern aircraft carrier for the Royal Navy. Well, we've got two of them. And please, none of the newspaper stories about Prince of Wales down below... As I've said before, it's one of the standards of naval war, na uh, naval operations that the low readiness asset will get to an extent canalized for the high readiness asset, especially when you only have two of something and you don't have enough stockpile stored. It doesn't mean you're selling it off or going to get rid of it. It just means you need the high readiness asset available immediately and the low readiness, uh, readiness asset you've got months to play with so if you take a part off it you've got time to order it and put the new uh, put the part back into it the same will happen when they switch round where queen elizabeth will get cannibalized for parts for prince of wales it's a sad fact and it's more to do with ongoing funding and the depth of stores maintained for navy and the fact that we only have two whereas we needed about three um rather than a sale of any uh, the sale of anything but What's her main purpose? Well, I would say they're a very useful command and control asset, and that's a major part of them, and information warfare. They're about reconnaissance. And if you consider that they carry Merlins and, Sp and, Lucky and Lightnings, well, that's a lot of information warfare going on. A lot of information being gathered. Yes, they can do strike. That's great. But that's the last part in a chain. There is often a various thing called a kill chain. Of acquisition, of identification, and of then of selection of the weapon most suited to do the job, and then the actual execution. That's the very last bit. 
And naval aviation has always been as much about the whole chain as it is about one part of the chain. And for a long time, the execution part, the best and most useful asset for that, was the battleship. And there is nothing wrong with that. Naval aviation has come a long way. And development of strike capability has been an amazing thing in terms of the capability it has brought to navies, in terms of their ability to influence events ashore. Capabilities which they never had. And in a world where the enemy didn't have battleships or battle cruisers, and your major efforts were influencing events ashore, or carrying out amphibious operations in support of things, in support of other actions in the face of enemy air defences and enemy air forces, aircraft carriers make much more sense than building battleships with the changing nature of that kind of operation and that requirement. But here is something else which could happen. Let's say rail guns do come back. People then say to me usually, oh, well, that'll mean aircraft carriers go away. It won't. Because, yeah, you might be able to launch box satellites and they can provide a targeting information for, you know, your rail guns and that's all great. But the trouble is, if it's electronic warfare, it can still, to an extent, be spoofed and all sorts of things can go on. as You're engaging at very long range. So at a certain point, you might want to have something else. And again, with box satellites, there can be other issues. You know, who knows what lasers get developed, and if rail guns are used to try and shoot them down, if it's cheap enough, who knows how that all evolves. But in the end, I can see a scenario developing where you have a carrier. Its purpose is to provide aircraft which can do the reconnaissance, the spotting, the shadowing, all that. And then the battleship or cruiser, or whatever we call it, with the rail guns, does the execution part. Because that is the most efficient, best way of delivering the necessary ordnance to the necessary location to achieve the necessary aim. Now, this isn't the future we'll get to at all now. Um, it looked pretty good when it was the future. It looked pretty cool. Sort of uncrewed uh, aviation vehicle version of a B-2 bomber flying from an aircraft carrier, let's be honest. That looked cool. Won't happen now, we're told. But who knows how the future evolves. Let's be honest. There was once this thing called the Wildcat, which was, in its first version, turned down in favour of a, another aircraft. And, well, they went away. They kept on working it. When that other aircraft got into combat, it didn't perform as well as they hoped. It really didn't perform as well as they hoped. And so, the US Navy went back to Groma and went, We'd like some Wildcats, please. We've seen what you've developed for the uh, French and the British, and we uh, rather like that idea. Can we have them? And they got them. And from the Wildcat came the Hellcat. And from the Hellcat came the Bearcat. And a dynasty was formed. So, what's the future of naval aviation? I can't tell you what aircraft it'll be. I can't tell you whether they're going to be crewed or uncrewed. I have my best guesses, but you can't tell. I can tell you what their missions are going to be. Because they're going to be those. It's going to be. The 
it's going to be information warfare heavy, force security, and strikes going to be part of it. But information warfare is going to be the constant. So, hope you enjoyed this. I know it's an hour long, and usually I try and keep these to... Well, honestly, I try and keep them to roughly... I would say roughly an hour, but it was I always aim for 50 minutes and usually end up at 75. I'm going to keep this to an hour because I know it was a lot of me talking and not a lot of the stuff which people probably, as a rule, enjoy more. Um... I get comments on the video sometimes about I'm rambling or I'm, you know, all, all sorts of things. And the point is, I'm doing the context and nuance as I see it. Uh, there are many, many great channels out there where you can go and get all the stats and figures to your heart's desire. And they produce them in beautiful detail with illustrations and imagery and skill in development which I can never match or rather have no ability to match at the moment unless I go and learn which would take me time and require well let's put it this way it would, it would require to have more money coming in as it is so I didn't have to do other things as well And I have to say, I'm, I'm never quite sure whether I want to go down that route, because those other channels are very good at it. And I don't think necessarily heading into a position where I am competing with people who are already established and very skilled in that is a good idea. And it doesn't seem to me that I'd then be adding anything interesting or different to the ongoing discussion. And I want to add something which is interesting to the ongoing discussion, because I want more people to be enjoying and loving naval history, like I do. So, I think I'm going to stick with these ones, this style. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you found it interesting. I usually end this with a question, and... I'm going to end this also with a thank you to Steve. I know you didn't. I didn't ask your permission to use your co your comment, and I know I've used it in this, but I want you again to say thank you. You, I'm sh you are a very very passionate and enthusiastic historian. I really enjoy your comments, and I just saw it and went. It happens. Because that is the natural thrust of quite a lot of history and quite a lot of people when they do the histories and even some of the people who do naval history stuff and they're talking about naval aviation as development, they miss out so much because they focus in on the sexy stuff and the sexy stuff is torpedoes, bombs and rockets. And it gives this huge weight of history around these things when it's the boring stuff. So the question today is, what is your favourite area of history where the popular, widely understood consensus narrative is misguided, misses out a huge chunk of development of things? I'd love to hear what you think it is. Well, what it is. Battle of Hakodote is tomorrow, or rather, in the, tomorrow is in 20 minutes at this point when I'm recording this, so, um, yeah, tomorrow, and I think you're going to enjoy it. I've written this, I wrote the slides while I was away, so I hope you enjoyed them, and what we've got next week in the Year of Technology, we've got Defending an Empire, Julian Corbett, oh, that's going to be fun, Building the Fleets of Jutland, Sovereign Battleships, all coming up, and I've also got to record Fleets of the Imperium, Warhammer 40k, Cheaper Way of War, the Juna Cole, Building the Fleets of Midway, and Dreadnought Battleships leading up to World War One. 
I should also possibly record how to build a navy. If you haven't already, and I know a lot of my channel have already heard a lot about it, I'm going to keep mentioning Shipshape. We really need your support for the trip to Australia, which is why I'm doing all this recording for June, which is why all the videos are for June are going to be recorded. We need your support. We need to raise enough money as soon as possible so we can start booking tickets and booking things. And it's getting tight, on t sort of time-wise. So thank you very much for those who have supported. We are very close to the point at which I can start booking tickets. Not quite there yet, but we're getting close. So thank you very much and take care. And there should be a link to ship shape down below. Toodles.